Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is Game 6 from the 2014 World Chess Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Vichy Anand. Going into this round, both players remain level at 2.5 points each. And Carlsen with the white pieces in this one, he opened with e4. So far in this match, it's been an e4 versus d4 battle. Every white game by Carlsen, he's played e4. And every white game by Anand, he's played d4. So we follow game four. Once again, seeing the Sicilian defense, we follow game four all the way up to just move two. This is where things are different. In game four, we saw g3. But in this game six, we now have d4 entering the open Sicilian. C takes d, knight takes d, a6, Sicilian con. To be a bit more exact, the Meroxi bind with c4. Forming a grip over d5, watching also over this potential b5 advance. Both pawn breaks are watched over with this pawn here. That pawn is pushed up before the knight plays into c3. Knight f6, knight c3, black pins. This is threat. It's defended. Don't blink. Before you know it, before we reach even move 10, the queens are gone. This king being uncastled is no issue. He'll find a perfect home on c7 and black is in a position to maybe destroy this queenside structure and this threat is still well it's back on in the position well, he needs to do something about that moving forward with e5 this does not address the potential idea that black has of ruining the queenside structure if white wants to make sure this pawn structure stays uh, as is stays undamaged and this is an idea to play bishop d2, but it allows black to play e5, stabilize the knight on f6, he won't be kicked away, and at the same time freeze this queen's bishop. Uh, the queen bishop can play to e6, this is a nice home. e5 interferes with this idea at the risk of having this be a serious issue, a structural defect. e5, after e5, it's knight d7. Knight e4 seems pretty appealing to pile up on the pinned piece, but there's a way out of it by playing a3. Bishop takes. Black is wise not to go further and go for a pawn grab. After a4, he runs the risk of getting trapped. If he goes here, there's bishop e3. He's still running the risk of getting trapped. f6 here. He's got to go there. This is not a good idea. Black is up a pawn, but has some serious issues. The bishop, not a great piece. The king, no longer such a great home on c7. Coordination on b6, maybe even a5. Bishop b6 ideas, not a good choice for black to go pawn hunting is the short story. After knight to e4, basically can only go as far as this. Going further, taking that guy out, big problems. Instead, in the game, it was knight d7. Limited with your replies on the white side. Bishop f4, f4. When I was live streaming this game, I was pointing out that ideally, you'd like to have the pawns be the ones who watch over other pawns. But we'll see a deeper idea in mind with this bishop f4 idea. It is, after all, developing. It can't be that bad. Developing, developing and defending. Black is now in a position to take the knight, and he does so. Wrecking the pawn structure here on the queen side. So this is the main imbalance in the game. We are in an end game. White has the bishop pair. White also has a deficient queen side pawn structure. Black, on the other hand, is a, a perfectly fine uh, pawn structure. And we'll just be a handful of moves away from having these rooks in direct connection with one another. We see that take shape right away with first king c7. Ensuing moves will include b6, c5, and finally getting the bishop on this nice long diagonal. White comes up now with the following plan of h4. Looking to eventually induce some weakness on the black side. This pawn is already a bit, clamp, uh, a bit cramping to the black king side structure, and this pawn also looks to do similar by being planted on h5. And then there's even ideas of rook up and over, applying pressure against the g-pawn, something that does take shape in the game. b6, 
H5, and I believe this is a very important moment in the game, one that can, uh, one that will uh, change the structure. Depending on this next move, uh, the structure is brought into question here. To allow H6 or not is a big question. In the game, H6 was prevented. Okay. If bishop b7 is played, white can play h6, and after g6, well, you know, first off, you have to play g6 here, as otherwise white's able to take, and this rook is brought right to life for free, and that pawn is going to fall soon thereafter. It's hard to imagine he wouldn't fall. Uh, so on h6, the short story here is that black would have to reply g6. Notice how that now weakens the f6 square. Bishop g g5 at some point can be super annoying now. This could turn out to be a very reliable home on g5 where he watches over d8 and then it's hard to imagine how these black rooks would become active for as long as the bishop is camping out on the g5 square. This was an alternative for black. Still, even though you would give up the dark squares to allow this advance, as in some some ensuing moves here, after bishop b7, if black was to allow this h6, g5, notice how there is, after let's say castles, there's this interesting idea of playing rook g8, g5, and having the knight come back here to f8 into even g6 or f4. This is an interesting regrouping that black could have maybe gone for, uh, but we didn't have this... Uh, structural shift on the king side of the board with uh, g5. By the way, you can't stop, or you can't play bishop g5 right now, preventing g5, because you'd be dropping this pawn. So g5 is now going to be coming with tempo. On bishop d3, there's c5, f3, to blunt this diagonal. And again, there's this idea of uh, knight to knight to f8 with g5. Notice how the knight would be conveniently defending against h7. This is something I overlooked uh, during the game. I was pointing out that playing something like g5, well, that would be very weakening. You know, how do you defend the pawn on h7? But having this knight retreat, having the knight jump into g6 was an interesting idea that black could have maybe gone with. We didn't enter that particular structure, but I wanted to devote some attention to it because it's really going to give direction to uh, the rest of the game. Once we have this structure in play, after black plays on this move 14, h6, there's now going to be a lot of pressure placed on the g-pawn, and black will have to be very quick to react to that uh, pressure. Following up, we have white castle, bishop b7, Rook d3, so the idea is revealed. A rook up and over to put pressure on g7. Rook a to g8 eventually comes after c5. G, rook g3, rook a to g8. It's important to go with that rook, by the way. After rook g3 and this rook to defend, well, what are you doing after bishop d3? This now threatens rook h, or bishop h7, attacking the rook, and then crashing through on g7. Therefore, it's rook a to g8, kind of just crawling up into a ball, but there's still very good coordination on the black side. The knight can also offer some support to the king side of the board, even permitting this g6 advance. Following up, bishop d3, making sure that the bishop cannot arrive on e4 to try and defend some of these king side squares. Knight f8. And now bishop to e3. It's important that black is very accurate here, making one passing move just to highlight some stuff here. If bishop c6, notice how after rook h4, knight f8, rook here, what are you doing to defend that pawn? And you're not doing anything. You're going to drop him. g6, we're just taking a bunch of times on this square. And at the end of it, white is up a pawn and is looking to pick up another. Black has to be very timely is what I'm getting at. Knight f8. And now on the move rook h4, black will be able to play g5. 
h takes g, knight takes g, bishop takes, rook takes, rook takes, pawn takes, and if you're picking up this pawn here, well, we're going to now enter an opposite color bishop ending and a likely draw. Rook h4 is not the best choice here. Instead, bishop e3 was decided on. Anticipating an eventual g5, and after this capture and the knight recapture, at least the knight from g6 will not be uh, landing on that square with tempo against the bishop. This guy, he gets out of the way on this move 19. Bishop e3 it is. g6, h takes g, knight takes, this pawn is hit, how to defend? Rook h5 to defend. This pawn has a lot of pressure on it, but black keeps pressure on the e5 pawn as well. Going in for this capture, rook takes h6. There's an immediate knight takes e5. He's even looking to capture that bishop with check. He has pressure on c4 as well. Can't grab that pawn so easily on h6. Rook h5 instead. Defends e5. And from this point on, we have a lot of... Mm, Maneuvering, both sides still trying to come up with something to make progress. These guys look like they're not very active, and well, they aren't. It's tough to improve on the black side, but really how much further progress can white make in this position? We have a little bit of shuffling that goes on. First, a bishop to c2. I'd like to point out a tactic here. If, for some reason, f3, the move... um f3 is played and this rook is unprotected. There are these tactical ideas present for black where he can take on e5 and on rook takes rook there's this in-between move of knight takes bishop. I'm not saying that this is best in any way to take right now, but I just wanted to highlight that this move knight takes e5 is available as soon as this rook is unprotected. Not the case right here. In the game we have bishop c2 King b7, just some slight improvements here. These last two moves, the bishop gets out of the way of these sort of tactics. The king gets to b7, stays clear of some potential pin. There might be some cases where when the knight takes on e5, he could end up in a pin. Well, that's no longer the case with the king off of that dark square. Following up, we have rook g4. This is watching over some... Uh, dark squares, and looking for, still for a plan here. It's it's tough to say what exactly the plan is for the white side. Again, there is some shuffling going on. A5 is played, looking to maybe one day have that pawn be a potential threat. If he's getting all the way down to A3, well, the significance of keeping this pawn around on the board has increased immensely, as without him around, he becomes just a couple squares away from queening. He could even be hunted down one day somehow with the bishop. Moving forward we have bishop d1, rook d8, bishop c2, like I was saying a little bit of shuffling back and forth and now finally white is coming up with some idea with this king d2 looking to get the king over here and make some pawn advances on uh, the king side of the board. Maybe play king e2, f3, Rook g3, rook h3, maybe get this structure in. In other words, an f3 and g4 structure, having the king on e2 to watch over what would be a base point on f on this f3 and g3 pawn structure. The king would like to be on that square. After king to d2, uh, this was a serious blunder. Um, how serious exactly? Well... In this position, it's certainly white who's the side who has pressure on black, right? We can see that because of the pressure, well, the defensive nature of the black pieces and the pressure that white has. Black is in a defensive position, white is in an aggressive position and trying to hold here. After king to d2, however, there's now, uh, this was a big oversight. Black is in a position to now take advantage of this unprotected rook, something I was highlighting earlier when the rook was on g3. I was pointing out how there would be a tactic after f3 due to a knight takes on this square and then capturing on d3. 
with check. Well, that check move, that taking on e5 and grabbing the bishop with check, is not there. That exact line is not there, but there still is a similar tactic available for black. In this position, black could play knight takes e5, but didn't. Instead, playing a4. This move, king d2, took about, well, it took about just one minute to play. And the reply, a4, took about just one minute. This move, however, this is an important point in the game, move 26 certainly has everyone's attention in this 2014 World Chess Championship match. Move 26 of game 6 is a big one. King d2, this was a mistake, and black did not capitalize on it. Knight takes e5 was available. This rook is unprotected. And on rook takes rook, let me point out on this move here, you're dropping the rook. And so on rook takes rook, we don't immediately recapture, but instead sweep in to grab a pawn with check. This counterattacking move can now be met with another check, and there's not a way for the king to throw a counterpunch back at the knight. King e2, only now do you grab the rook. And after the smoke clears, it's black who's the side who has extra material here, and black would be the one who's pressing for a win. We didn't have that, though, but what a turn of events there. One blunder and then simply not taking advantage or not seeing this opportunity to take on e5. Very, very interesting moment, not only, again, in this game, but certainly in this match. What followed was, again, a4 after just about a minute, King e2, so now there's no longer that tactic available. Following up, we have a3, f3, rook d8, king e1. This is a tough one for me to really uh, uh, wrap my head around. I'm thinking it's to stay clear of some knight check. Uh, I'm not completely sure what the main idea is behind having king to e1. It's certainly... Uh, in many lines, staying out of any harm's way by the bishop. There won't be any bishop check in this position here. There won't be any, in some lines, a knight check. Not exactly sure, to be honest. Following up rook d7, bishop c1. This pawn has some pressure on it. Black is there to defend. Initially, I thought to myself, why exactly go forward with defending this pawn directly? Because isn't it defended indirectly, like... Just making a passing move, if this is captured now, isn't rook a8 a fine move? And it would be, but there's an additional idea behind putting the rook on a8 at this moment right here. It's not just to defend the pawn directly, but black has this idea of now jumping into the a4 square, trying to eliminate this light square bishop, and then maybe enter uh, the white position on the white squares in some way. For example, if white is going in for this type of capture, maybe there's a way for black to enter on these light squares by way of bishop to a4, or, well, more directly, he could do stuff like this, double rooks, and look at that d1 square. White has to be very careful about giving up their light square bishop. Yes, you could win a pawn on this side of the board, but you potentially subject your king to some problems. This invasion square on d1 is the main point. In the game we had after rook to a8, king e2, bishop a4, bishop e4 with check, and after bishop to c6, this is, uh, as it turns out, the main, well, the, the last big blunder here after, well, I don't know, big blunder, but this is not the best continuation after bishop e4 and bishop c6. Better resistance Surprisingly enough, it's a very awkward move. It's a computer-like move, but it has some great depth to it. After king e7, this is, this is the best move in this position instead of bishop blocks, as we'll soon find out. After king a7, giving up the exchange, and after bishop takes a3, this rook gets to enter the position. Rook takes h6. Rook a1 threatens to pick up the pawn with check. King e3, knight takes e5, hits the rook, hits this pawn here. 
Rook g7, knight takes c4 with check, king f4, and after all that, after giving up the exchange, this is still maybe, uh, it, I should say black has maybe some potential to hold on here, though it will still be quite difficult. This knight is there at least to secure the f7 pawn, the all-important f7 pawn. If he is no longer around on this uh, seventh rank, the black king will officially be cut off, and you can anticipate mate just around the corner. This is just barely being held together in this variation here where black is giving up the exchange with king to a7, but tough, tough one to see for sure. In the game, it was bishop c6. Bishop takes knight now. Black, for just this moment, is not so quick to now enter on the d-file. The bishop is not there in coordination with the rook on d1. So it is at this moment... White crashes through on g6, finally. Rook takes. Bishop returns to a4. Rook takes e6. Rook d1. Black has to try for something active because all of these pawns are now falling. h6 is ready to fall, and after that, b6 with check. Another pawn is falling. Rook a1, threatening rook takes pawn with a fork. White gets out of that by improving his king position. Bishop to c2, rook to e7 check, and it is at this point that Anand resigns. There's simply not a good choice here for black. This last move here, bishop to c2, is throwing a punch at the bishop, but after rook e7, what are your options here? These are your four choices. Going here, well, that's mate in one and two. Doing something else, such as playing back here. Rook takes h6 again. How are you dealing with rook h6? There's not a good, there's not going to be a good defense there. And the other one, king a6, well, white doesn't have to worry about rook takes bishop now. And so white can simply scoop up another pawn. This pawn is now in a pin. If the rook grabs the pawn here, well, there goes yet another pawn. It's just too much material. There's no counterattack against the white king. The Black King is absolutely toast in this position, but what a game this one turned out to be. Again, going back to that move 26, King D2, big mistake on the white side, and Black did not capitalize on it in this game, and it really turns out uh, to cost Anand in this game, in this match, quite possibly. Uh, we'll see how things pan out, but without question, seeing these back-to-back -back blunders, they are... Mm, very, very rare. Anyhow, uh, I'm not sure what more to add. It was very exciting uh, during the live stream. Uh, the whole board in this game was made use of. The center, the king side, and the queen side. And, well, at the end again, after this rook to e7 move, the king does not have a good choice. And again, at this point, Anand resigned. And with that, we have now Carlson with the lead. Three and a half points to two and a half points going into... Game 7, we'll see what happens at that point. So uh, that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care.